The topic for this evening's discussion will be yoga. Uh, that is a, somewhat of a vast and uh, complex issue to try to delve into, but I do want to touch on some of the general points on some of the main uh, lines of, of practice of, of the uh, idea of yoga. Now, uh, most people do have some knowledge of the idea of yoga as it has, as it has um, come into our mainstream thinking somewhat through popular culture and through the media and different ways that uh, the idea of yoga has uh, at least been made known to our mainstream in the West here as it is uh, a practice that was originated in the East and has been adapted for our use. Again, it is a, a very old, old practice originally. Yoga uh, was first used for the benefit of man uh, at, after the time that humanity became individualized or self-conscious. And so you're talking many, many millions of years ago that uh, the basic fundamentals of yoga began to be taught and, and implemented with mankind. And that being the case, the uh, first age in which we became aware of the practice of yoga in which it was first shown to mankind, if you will, was during the Lemurian days, again, many, many millions of years ago. And the first aspects of yoga were to get humankind to get the organs to function and to consciously work with the organs to consciously have them function. And as uh, we have uh, refined the body over these many, many millions of years, now a lot of this activity is automatic. But initially, the practice had to be implemented to instill this quality, this rhythmic quality within the organs of the body and to get them to work together. It was a conscious practice initially and this was the, the early beginnings of the idea of yoga. Now the word yoga itself comes from the word yug, which means yoke and it symbolizes union. Again, that's a very old word, the term uh, yug, or again yoke and that again if you visualize what a yoke does it symbolizes a union and generally when we think of a yoke we think of perhaps an oxen pulling a cart or horses pulling a wagon. We, you know, we think of some uh, animal that's tied to uh, some device that's uh, used for, for work, for hauling a load or what have you. And again this union, this yoke that allows the animal energy to be harnessed by a man uh, to do some greater work. And again, that symbolism, uh, it ties in very much to this idea of, may, of having a union. And so when a man, or, or woman for that matter, when, when a person practices yoga, this idea of union, they're finding their way back, if you will, in a sense. And they're finding uh, a way of synthesis. Now, that may just be to synthesize the functioning within the human body and to keep oneself in a state of balance, in a state of optimum health and a state of well-being. And that is uh, one of the main practices and that's one of the main reasons why yoga is considered for the average person, uh, again, just to, uh, to consider this exchange of energy as well that's involved. Certainly we do have energy that, exchange, that uh, flows through the human body. We, have, uh, we are multi-layered as far as our as far as uh, the makeup of man, and we do have the energy body, which is known as the etheric body. We have the astral or emotional body, and then we have the mental body. The, those are the three lower aspects of man that make us make up our being. And this again, this this union at the higher levels aligns and unites these aspects in man into a synthesis, uh, and again makes for uh, more optimum exchange of energy. Energy is constantly going through the human body and it uh, animates a system, it uh, pushes the blood through the system, it works the nervous system, works the brain impulses, it works the circulatory system. And so this energy is constantly in flow as to how it moves through the system in any give, given person depends on where that energy is centered. And so again, yoga is one practice uh, to move this energy, to consciously move the energy through the body in some, fa in some fashion uh, again, to, to form some merger, some union, some alignment. And uh, some people practice yoga with the intention of having some kind of approach to the divine, some kind of, re of union 
with the divine. Again, thinking of the idea of yoga as a, as a yoke, as an, something that adjoins one thing to another. We can find through this idea of union or yoga a way to, to rediscover a path, if you will, uh, back to divinity, to rediscover the path to divinity and to ultimately, at the highest levels of yoga, make our individual personal will one with the divine will. Now, uh, when people think of yoga as it's been impressed to us in the mainstream thinking and through uh, our Western culture, people generally think of a large people, group of people getting together and sitting and doing postures and stretching and also the breathing exercises that are involved as well with that. And that, uh, that is definitely yoga and that is a part of yoga, but that more so uh, corresponds to what you might term the lower forms of yoga. As, there, as in uh, many teachings, there's always a lower and a higher teaching, and yoga is no exception to that. And so when you think of the postures, uh, the stretching exercises, and also the breathing, the, the uh, breathing exercises that, uh, are, that, uh, some of exercise, that some of these yoga exercises entail, uh, then you can see, again, what, what, uh, what is generally considered by yoga, but that is only really half of the, the full complete picture. Yoga more so entails other aspects as well than just uh, the postures and the, uh, again, the stretching and the breathing exercises. And certainly these do come into play and do uh, have a, a, a purpose for people to want to take advantage of. Now I've spoken on my show previously as far as how most the average person is generally centered, if you will. Most people are centered in their emotional, their astral or the desire nature. And then some of, of humanity is centered more so in the mental aspect or in the thinking, uh, thinking apparatus. And we are becoming more so increasingly mental. And so we find that the idea of using yoga is becoming more desirable to more people as they have a yearning, a desire to at some level link their thinking apparatus, link mind with heart. And that, uh, that's an age old practice as well to try to link those aspects up. And so uh, again, people try to uh, accomplish that through me the means of yoga that are generally known and uh, they try to find a sense of proportion and they try to have the optimum flow of energy achieved and also they try to incorporate breath as it is a creative it's a reflection of, of creation at the highest levels uh, the highest universal levels our universe is created through breath if you will the out breathing into this physical plane of a divine thought is basically the same way that that works and so when we exercise with the breath or we use the breath in a creative manner we are in turn mirroring the creative breath and outbreathing of the divine on the largest scales. And so the smaller mirrors the larger in that respect. Now certainly uh, yoga is uh, much touted for the way that it uh, helps some folks to have relaxation and to relieve stress. And that is, uh, stress is one key thing that does tend to hold many people back in our modern day and age because again, us being both emotionally predisposed and mentally predisposed, we're going to have a chance to have more stress in our lives. Again, this fast-paced life that we live in, in this day and age and these, in the cities that we live in tend to promote more and more stress, again, because we have to keep up at all turns, uh, you know, in our careers, our social lives, uh, just competing in line at the grocery store, many different things that uh, may cause one stress and anxiety through the day. And also the idea of centering oneself. Again, the idea, once again, of a, of a synthesis or an alignment that may be achieved through these means and certainly, uh, if we consider here in Austin, there are many, many schools that offer instruction into the varying forms of yoga. Uh, more than you can shake a stick at. There are probably literally hundreds here in Austin alone, uh, much less if we consider the whole United States and the whole Western world, how this Eastern concept has really uh, infiltrated, I guess you can maybe use that word if, if you'd like, uh, into our Western thinking and our Western society. And uh, this is a sign of the times very much so, and, and I think increasingly, many people feel as well, increasingly so, this is going to be a sign of things to come as far as both the astrological timing of us moving into the Aquarian Age and also just uh, the m more emphasis of merging East and West. This idea of using the best that the East has to offer 
and the best that the West has to offer and to meld those two schools, those two ways of thinking into one unified course that will allow for, again, the optimum, optimum benefits of both these fields. Uh, we can make use of, of um, Eastern as well as Western ways and to shun either one at the expense of the other I think is, is somewhat of a mistake because they're both equal and valid in some respects, uh, in many respects, and so they, they both have their place. And so again, the ways of the East are more so merging with the lifestyle of the West and they're being more so adapted to fit into this Western way of life that we have and uh, for use for our optimum health and well-being. Now also, uh, there are some school districts as well that have been implementing the idea of using yoga for, the, for students. And this idea of having these kids go through these postures and these, these different routines and these different rituals uh, that's Eastern based may scare some folks and I can kind of understand that. Uh, maybe some people are somewhat afraid that their kid before too long is going to have a little altar set up in their room to Ganesh or something along those lines. And, uh, I would just caution people to consider it a bit. Uh, if this is something that's going to allow them to center themselves and allow them to be more in touch and more understanding of their own nature, then it's certainly got to be, a, in my estimation especially, it's got to be a vast improvement over what's already uh, mainly being uh, implemented, and that is uh, like the Ritalin kid syndrome where kids are being encouraged to take these, dr these drugs at younger and younger ages if they have so-called attention deficit disorder or what have you and they, uh, they seem to uh, need to, the, the authorities find some need in curbing this person's attention and their focus and so they want to localize the focus and again many, po many ways, uh, many schools and many children are being put on the Ritalin and these uh, various other types of drugs and uh, I would say that the the practice of yoga uh, in my estimation would do much more for the child's benefit than uh, these psychotropic, psychotropic drugs that are being prescribed at younger and younger ages that tend to be much more limiting uh, than something like yoga even though that may sound foreign to people that may concern folks uh, it, it, I think it's a much better option now, as far as describing the different schools of yoga, the, I'm going to start with more so the lower that, uh, again, deal with postures and the breathing exercises and the stretching exercises that people are more, more familiar with. Uh, the first would be called Hatha Yoga. And Hatha Yoga can be considered the science of the control of the body and mind with the aim of bodily perfection. Uh, this type of yoga seeks to control mind through the control of the body. And so that's where the focus lies, is on the physical body in order to have some union with the mental thinking apparatus in man. And so that, in essence, would be the polar opposite, if you will, to another type of yoga, which is called Raja Yoga, uh, in which case the mind is used to control the body. It's just the exact opposite. In Hatha Yoga, the body seeks to control the mind, and in Raja Yoga, the mind seeks to control the body. And so Hatha Yoga is in essence a materialistic form of yoga because it is concentrating on the dense physical vehicle as opposed to our higher inner aspects as some of these other types of yoga tend to deal with. And uh, it has its origin, as I spoke earlier, in the Lemurian days or when man began to exercise some measure of self-consciousness uh, at its very beginning and, and early stages. And man became aware, self-aware and uh, so what is thought of yoga today traditionally when you see the posturing and what have you that in essence is a very very old old form of yoga that has been passed down through these various schools uh, to our modern day now um, it can be used by the practitioner to bring about conscious control of all the organs of the body heart stomach lungs etc uh, but since these organs have functioned automatically for countless years, and again, I do have to emphasize millions of years that they've uh, functioned on their own automatically, uh, there is a great deal of redundancy in trying to consciously control an aspect of ourselves that essentially takes care of and operates itself. Again, at an unconscious level, we don't have to consciously think about breathing when we're asleep at night, for instance, or thinking about 
Oh, I need my heart to push the blood through my circulatory system. This is an automatic response that's been built in as we have evolved and refined this physical vehicle to the point that it is today. And so in some instances, these lower, if you will, and I, I don't mean to use that term lower in a derogatory fashion, uh, it just, um, there are, there, these are lesser forms of yoga in, in all uh, honesty. And so uh, the idea of scientific athletic training in the West has correspondences to Hatha Yoga. And the idea, again, of training the physical body, to enhance the physical body, to, to have some results through these physical exercises. Now the next instance of uh, what I would again term these lower forms of yoga would be Laya Yoga. And it is a, counter, a counterpart to Hatha Yoga. It concerns the vital body or the energy body or the etheric body that I have spoken of previously on, on my show. And again, that is the energy body, the energy body that underlies the dense physical and does keep the blood flowing. It keeps uh, the circulatory system, again, doing what it needs to do. Uh, the nervous system keeps, gives us our senses and it gives us the ability for cognitive thought through the brain, uh, the electrical impulses of the brain. And so this idea of Laya Yoga, again, being a, being a counterpart to the Hatha Yoga, uh, this type of yoga seeks the control of the vitality and energy, excuse me, that operates and animates the physical body. Laya means, in essence, center. And conscious control is sought over the flow of energy into one or another of the energy centers of the etheric body, which are spoken of the East spoken of in the East as chakras. Now control over the breath and breathing exercises are also, uh, they're also emphasized and key to this type of yoga. Now this type of yoga, again, uh, when one person concentrates actively on one or another of the centers and really focuses in on the center, uh, that can lead to some some different things that are not so good and that has, there needs to be a word of caution extra, uh, that needs to be given as far as these types of exercises. Um, when a person tries to work on the centers and tries to move this energy through the system forcibly, it depends on where one is centered and where one's motive and focus lies. If one is, low, if, uh, one is focused below the diaphragm so-called and the sex appetite and the lower appetites are the main appetites, then certainly uh, emphasis on the centers, if one is primarily focused in one's everyday routine through this lower aspects of self, then that is what's going to tend to be emphasized if one tries to work on the centers specifically without some measure of alignment so-called. And that idea of integrating the personality in the sense of aligning the energy body, the etheric body, with the astral or emotional body and in turn aligning that with the mental or the thinking aspect of man and then moving that alignment on to even more inclusive levels of awareness at even higher levels that are soul inclusive and eventually inclusive of the will or father in heaven aspect at even the higher levels of so-called yoga or again union based on the word yug or yoke again the idea of a yoke joining two Two, two things together in, in some synthesis. And so considering the stimulation of the energy through the seven centers, the chakra centers, and again there are, there are other centers but there are seven main centers, uh, <clears throat> arousing this stimulation initially starts from the center at the base of the spine and then is moved from the center at the base of the spine through the system. And this is spoken of as uh, the serpent fire or kundalini as far as this energy that basically lies more or less latent uh, in this lower aspect of ourselves until it's acted, enacted upon and then it can be moved through the system and it can uh, there are various ways for it to move through the system um, some more unconscious than others some conscious some unconscious and uh, Really, the best way, the safest way to move the energy through the system is just through a life of selfless service, and I really can't emphasize that enough. If uh, we are one-pointed in our desire, our aspirations, and our response to want to help out, help our fellow man, and work in some way for the salvaging of the race, then that will in turn take care of itself, and these centers will automatically open up in the proper ordered fashion 
so that man, so the man uh, that has this high aspiration can have the capacity and energy available to do the work necessary to bring whatever they envision down to the physical plane. And so that is, that's part and parcel of this whole idea of moving this energy. Uh, and that's why much caution must be given to this exercise. If one is not centered somewhat, if someone does not have, if someone does, has not negated somewhat their lower material self and their selfish tendencies, the me, me, me tendencies, then they're going to have difficulty with this type of exercise and trying to use this kind of yoga, laya or kundalini yoga as they're, they're popular, popularly called as far as moving the energy through the centers. And so there has to be caution placed in this, this exercise because we can draw into our, our being, if you will, negative energy. There's, this is a magnetic, magnetic scientific process through yoga that's set up. And so we set up currents by this practice by moving thought and, and uh, using thought to move this energy that these currents can be set up and we can draw to us negative, negative energy and they can stick to us, attach itself to us, to us and leech itself to us uh, to our displeasure, discomfort and uh, even worse case scenarios than that can even eventuate as well where insanity, severe sickness or in some cases death can eventuate from, from this type of thing. Uh, now I don't want to dissuade or discourage people from trying to practice take up the practice of yoga because in this day and age we have become somewhat specialized and we are at the level as far as again our evolutionary level uh, being specialized enough to handle this type of exercise, the yoga exercise, even if it is through the posturing, the breathing and the stretching exercises that we are centered enough as a society, the people that are endeavoring to, to try this type of yoga, that they are centered enough to where it won't cause them a, a whole lot of major discomfort or harm. And if you do find through any kind of yoga exercise that you do have discomfort or you do have uh, symptoms crop up or you do have maybe possibly the lower appetites accentuated and the sex appetite becomes more accentuated or the, the appetite for food, the physical appetite and those types of things increase, then one might want to check oneself and, and kind of assess where they are with their motive and what this type of exercise is doing to them and, and what it's causing to come out of them, if you will, what's being emphasized in the, in the body through this exercise. Now again, uh, if the lower appetites are awakened, uh, again the sex appetite and these type of appetites are overemphasized through the centers, this improper st uh, stimulation will lead to health problems and again in, in the mind aspect, uh, possibly to insanity or at least to some nervous conditions. Uh, again, these magnetic currents that are set up do like attracts like and so if we are negatively centered and we try to move through these exercises uh, we're going to find probably negative results in many instances unless we have the proper motivation and uh, in the uh, it's one uh, instance as far as health problems might be uh, prostate cancer we have an increasing uh, increasing amount of prostate cancer being de uh, that's developing in the Western world, and I think that uh, definitely ties into overemphasis on the lower centers and the sex appetites, and that uh, that overemphasis can be detrimental to our health. Now, again, uh, the both hatha and laya or kundalini yoga are very old, and uh, but again, they're more of a material type of yoga because they concentrate on, on the individual self. They're not concentrating on a broader outlook or trying to create some kind of union with an idea in mind of a greater service, a greater moving out. And that's the key to that. And so this brings us to a closer look at the bridging and synthetic forms of yoga. Uh, the higher forms of, of yoga are very inclusive and... Uh, they're sought after and practiced by those who have awakened to some degree the aspiration to divinity, uh, the knowledge of the soul, and, des and the desire to serve one's fellow man. Uh, the higher forms of yoga don't make use of postures. The higher forms of yoga are meditation, and that is the other half of, meditation, of yoga that's not popularly considered is meditation. The word yoga or yug, or again imp implying union, is also meditation. Yoga is meditation at its highest levels. And so making use of an alignment to align again the etheric, the emotional, and the mental nature and to achieve some active state of awareness and achievement of union with the higher divine nature is the goal of the, again these higher forms of yoga. 
uh, this concentrated, directed point of focus starts with the heart, and that's something I really can't emphasize enough either. Um, all true meditation starts with the heart, and uh, all beginning instruction, again, should start with the heart and with the conscious stilling of the emotional or astral nature. And in minute, most people, we can think of the astral nature as just a violent sea, just in like a, we can think of a small boat being tossed and turned about on this violent sea. That's how, that is an accurate reflection of most people's astral nature. But if we can still that nature, keep it calm, keep our emotional nature calm, then that emotional nature can be a reflector of the higher mental capacities. And we can bring that down into our physical vessels and we can make use of that capacity and that energy. And that's why the idea of starting with the heart and stilling the heart is very key to any introductory moves towards implementing a routine and a ritual of meditation. And that's another thing too. Meditation can't be something that ha that's done once a week or once every month or once in a blue moon. There has to be some rhythm and some ritual involved with it to where, uh, for instance, if a person would choose to meditate, if they could meditate in the early morning, that's the optimum time. And if they could meditate again in the same place, in a recurring fashion as well, because again, the idea of magnetism, of drawing in, bringing in this magnetic aspect, this magnetic link, and like creating, uh, like drawing like, like attracting like, that if we use the same area to meditate in and we use the same time, then again, a magnetic link will be set up between this area and our meditation practice, and the rhythm can begin to set in, and, and uh, we can use this idea of rhythm more so and more so to have more success in this practice. Uh, let's see here, as far as um, the idea of yoga and the idea of there being a lesser and a greater, uh, there is a rule in esoteric science that the greater may include the lesser. Now that is not always the case, but in many instances the greater includes the lesser. And yoga is an example of this rule that the greater the meditation forms of yoga include the lesser forms. And so one can achieve through a state of meditation, a meditative contemplation and reflection, what is also garnished through this exercise of the posturing and the, um, the stretching and the breathing exercises. All of that is incorporated in this practice of meditation. And so really all one needs to do in order to bring in that optimum health benefit that's achieved through the, again, Hatha or Laya or Kundalini Yoga, one can bring that in into, again, this higher aspect of yoga, because the greater aspects, the higher forms of yoga, which is meditation, do include the lesser in their, in their practice. And so for those that have the sense of the early pangs of responsibility awaking in, awaking in them and have some measure of devotion to the divine and desire to serve one's fellow man, a form of yoga is available that is called bhakti yoga, and that is an aspirational or a devotional yoga and it may be very fruitful and of use to many people a day. If, if uh, people are starting to have some idea of a responsibility that's eating away at them, that uh, they have some level of understanding at a level outside of their own environment, if they're starting to think more on a grand scale and think more on, of an, on an inclusive scale and to develop what is in some instances known as the Christ consciousness or a more a very much an inclusive approach, an inclusive awareness that's based on contact with one's own soul. And that also is a very important factor in the early, in the, the, ba the basis for this early form of meditation, uh, which again, uh, this particular uh, devotional type of, of yoga or meditation is known as bhakti. And it deals with the stilling and the quieting of the emotional nature and the visualizing of the link between the heart and the divine heart and the hearts of all living things. And to have that sense of warmth, that sense of reassurance, that sense of knowingness, if you will, that there is an interconnectedness in all things. And at, that, at these early aspirational levels, a bhakti yoga is one way in which that can be fulfilled and um, that, can be, that experience can be brought in and anchored into the physical vessel. And this is the same as a mystical experience that uh, the, the uh, saints of the Catholic Church have described, it, cataloged, and confessed to throughout the ages. It's in essence a mystical, because it's based on the heart approach, and an idea of 
uh, of identifying one's own heart, one's own aspiration with the larger sacrificial aspect of the heart. And again, this is just the beginning stages of this aspirational idea of yoga. And uh, this particular yoga, bhakti yoga, had its start in the later days of Atlantis, uh, but it still again has a place and a significance in the life of the modern seeker of truth if one is uh, again a, a, along the so-called mystical path and uh, has uh, the yearning of return to, t to try to discover some path of approach, some path of return to divinity. Uh, this is an exercise that can be fruitful and beneficial. Now to move to the next step, uh, as far as the what would be considered the high aspect of yoga, it, that would be considered Raja Yoga, or what is known as the kingly science of the soul. The term Raja mean, meaning essentially king or ruler, if you will, maybe. Uh, and since the very early Indian days, since the, the first great culture that propped itself up after the, the great flood, Raja Yoga was the system that was in place at that time. And this system emphasizes at one moment integration of the personality and a unity. And this, uh, this deals with merging the lower self, if you will, the etheric, the astral, and the mental with the higher aspect, with the soul, and in turn becoming what's known as a soul-infused personality. And that is the practice, uh, that is the goal and, and as far as the uh, a bulk of this study through Raja Yoga is through, again, an alignment, a synthesis of aligning the three bodies of man, again, um, uh, the etheric or the energy body, the emotional the, or the astral, with the mental aspect, to keep those aligned to where not one body dominates but there is an integration, an alignment, to where there's a free exchange and flow of energy from the level of soul down into our physical vessel. And again, at, the, at its high culmination, would lead into what's known as a soul-infused personality, or the condition where the three bodies are so aligned and integrated and synthesized with one another that again, this channel, this, this uh, alignment, this anchoring of the, of the soul energy can come into being. And so, uh, as far as the idea of, of this unfoldment, this unfolding of awareness, this unfolding of consciousness that takes place through the practice of meditation, or through the practice of yoga, uh, we find the symbol in the east of the lotus, and even the, the position that one tends to sit in, that the popular position with the legs crossed and the hands uh, interlaced, fingers and hands placed in the lap, that, that idea, uh, that posture, if you will, is known as a lotus posture, and that is named after the lotus flower, uh, and that's, again, a symbol that has been borrowed from the East, the idea of the lotus, and the idea of the unfolding of the, lo of the lotus, and also uh, the idea that uh, our energy centers, the, the so-called chakra centers, also have a correspondence to the lotus, and as they unfold, they are spoken of as a number of petaled lotus, and so you could speak of a 12-petaled lotus or a 1,000-petaled lotus, uh, depending on which center you're describing. And um, again, the higher centers are going to be the more multi-petaled lotus flowers. But again, these do correspond to the centers and this idea of an unfolding, an unfolding awareness, an unfolding consciousness. And in the West, the symbol of the rose has been adapted and adopted for us. And so the unfolding from the bud into the flowering rose is that also, it also carries over that same idea, that same symbolism of, a, of an unfolding of consciousness. And again, just the, the choice of flower, the lotus in the east, the rose in the west. And again, the idea that a union has taken place in which some of the ideas of the east have been merged with the ideas of the west. And in the instance of yoga and meditation practice, this is very much the case. And we find the merging taking place of east and west. Uh, so many people might be familiar with the idea of the voice of the silence and that idea of sitting very still and, and having a listening, a listening passive uh, sense. And I have to emphasize that that can be very dangerous. Uh, being passive, being negative, if you will, sets up those magnetic currents and it's an indrawing sensation. And so if we set ourselves up to be blank in our minds and to be passive in, in a sense, 
and not active in our minds and our thinkings during a meditation process, then we set up these currents where we can allow, again, negative influences to draw themselves to us and leech themselves and attach themselves. Meditation must be proactive. It must be an active, linking, focused point of tension between one's lower self and one's higher self. And that linking, that alignment must be set up and must be focused upon, and again, in a proactive, positive sense, not in a negative or receptive sense, because, uh, again, we, we uh, will be prone to allowing in influences that may not be the best influences. They may be negative, and people can be taken advantage of, especially if there's, uh, if people approach this blindly without some level of instruction, some level of understanding. They just jump blindly into some forms of meditation. They may struggle and have some difficulties, and they can open up a whole can of worms, a Pandora's box that they really would wish that they hadn't done so. Uh, now, again, uh, coming from India, is this Raja Yoga and India basically is the seat of occult science. Now, getting past the idea of occult as a bad word, it, it simply means hidden. Uh, if you look at the root word of occult, it simply means hidden. And so we're dealing with the hidden aspect, the soul and the spirit or father in heaven through this union, through this, first of all, an awareness, a conscious understanding that we have these aspects and then more of a merger, more of a merger, again, through a soul-infused personality uh, that aligns itself with the spirit of Father in Heaven and to where we can make our will one with the divine will. Now, the idea of visualization is very key as well. Through the idea of yoga, the idea of as if thinking comes into play, and we think as if. So, in the idea of being the soul-infused personality, if one is n has not reached that capacity in their lives, which, honestly, not that many people in the world have genuinely achieved a, a real sense of integration. We might have the beginning aspects of it, but a real sense of integration in the average person is non-existent. Uh, it's, it's a specialized condition, and it's, it has to be brought about either, again, through active service or through, again, these means of prematurely, again, through meditation or some other means, bringing forth this alignment. And so visualizing thinking as if, thinking as if we are the integrated personality, thinking as if we are the soul-infused personality carries great weight because we build into ourselves, we build into our dense physical vehicle more refined matter, and we have the counterpart on the etheric, the astral, and the mental of this dense physical vehicle, and so in this refined states of matter, in the etheric, the astral, and the mental, increasingly refined as we go higher to the mental, uh, we can build in these qualities, and we build in the senses of the lower vehicle into the astral, the emotional, and the etheric body. And so we have that link more so ingrained and set up, and so this becomes a, the, lay of, the way of least resistance, ultimately, for the spiritually inclined person to find the path back to divinity. And this is a very excellent way. Also, stilling of the mind is very key, and that comes into to, uh, play a lot, too. The mind stuff is known as chitta in the East, and to still the chitta chatter, if you will, is a key component to still all the loose thinkings that goes through the mind and keep the mind calm and serene in the same sense that the astral nature must be kept calm and serene for this union, if you will, this alignment to have its optimum effect take place. And also the controlling of the modifications, the modifications of the mind and the tendency for, ch for thought to constantly change and move from one subject to the next. It constantly plays in. And so, again, controlling the mind, controlling the chitta or mind stuff, and controlling the modifications of the mind comes into play. And again, this through these higher forms of yoga, um, Raja Yoga, and then I would like to also uh, speak about the, also the process of building. The process of, of aligning and, and the synthetic process is also very much a building process. And, uh, for instance, through masonry, uh, some may be familiar with the idea of building the Temple of Solomon. This very much ties in. In the East, uh, the idea is, is called the building of the Antakarana, and that includes also what's known as the Sutratma, which is the life cord or the silver cord. And these are very real, substantial cords, links, if you will, that, uh, especially the Sutratma, it links the heart to our higher aspect, uh, these are the links that we build in ourselves that allow us this link with the higher and allow a building emerging, if you will, from our lower physical nature 
with the higher aspect and ultimately with the Father or Will aspect, the Father in Heaven aspect. I would like to go ahead and grab a call and see what's going on. Hello, caller. Hi, uh, I just had a question um, about yoga. Uh, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> being narrow-minded as they are, <laughs> um, they would teach that um, we shouldn't do meditation because of possible demonic possession. Um, you know how some people actually get to the level where they could have an out of out of body experience or, or something like this. Mm -hmm. That uh, this would allow uh, demons to be able to come in. Do you have um, any input on that or? Uh, yes, and I, I did speak about that somewhat. As far as the premature opening of the center, so called, if there is not some level of instruction, some practical instruction, because again, this science has been around for literally millions of years, right. and so there is practical instruction. But for someone to exercise these kinds of things blindly, and again, to take on this passive, if you take on a passive receptive attitude during any kind of meditation or yoga, you are consciously or unconsciously inviting currents. And again, these little creatures, yeah. um, if you will, these little entities, uh, and also greater entities too, the idea of possession and the idea of obsession tie in very much with that. And the idea, um, you know, uh, the Catholic Church very much believes in exorcism for this type of thing. And they very much believe that uh, a person can be possessed, can be obsessed. And I would agree that that can indeed take place. Or at the very least, their lower material appetites can be accentuated and emphasized over the higher, and so one can what get you caught mean by up. What that? It's like car carnal uh, desire. Right. Like, Maybe t uh, prone towards alcohol alcoholism mm -hmm. or the sex nature or uh, f appetite for food or any of the, the, the which, what I would tend to term the gross material instincts, you know, that are based on the fight or flight instinct, mm -hmm. that are more of our animal lower nature, that are. Um, basically, again, more animal than divine and keep us centered in that lower aspect, that, that instinctual as opposed to intuitional, and we just keep going through the motions in that sense and looking for satisfaction at that low level. So in, that, that person generally is not going to be attracted by any stretch to the idea of yoga, and so that, that has built-in safeguards already that the average man that is very low in their outlook, if you will, and they're centered in just the materialistic na nature exclusively, they're not going to have the discipline or the desire to want to get into this kind of practice and so that's going to safeguard them from some harm in that sense. But then we do have the people that are into the experimentation and they want to try it out and they want to, there's a term sitting for development and that's a dangerous term that I have to bring up as well. There are those that choose to sit and try to build into themselves for their own material gain some increased awareness, some increased capacity, some increased power through this process, and this does you mean take to place. Use it in a negative sense. Is yes, okay. and this is this is uh, basically equivalent in some sense at a level to black magic by bringing in this ability, just for one's own material well-being, just <laughs> uh, you know for one's own self, and not because really the highest aspects of yoga or meditation should have in mind taking in a higher aspiration or higher impression and then spreading it out. As far as the idea of the cross, if you understand the idea of the, the cross, the cross is built on the concept of service as far as taking in vertically impression from the divine and then spreading it out horizontally in some kind of active service to one's fellow man. That is the whole key. So the higher aspects of meditation deal with improving oneself and one's capacity and one's connection with the divine so that we can be better, more optimum, channels and expressors of the divine and that we can again, as, uh, as Christ taught, make our will one with the divine will. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be achieved through this process. Through, through proper instruction, that's what you're saying, in order to avoid that. Right, and, but I don't want to discourage people from doing uh, any kind of meditation or, or, or yoga, but just proceed with caution and understand your motives is the key thing. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for your call. Have a nice okay. evening. Hello, caller. Hello. Hi, how are you? I, just fine. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask about the Kundalini Yoga. Yes. Because I do that. Mm hmm. And d didn't you say something bad about that? It potentially could be, just like I spoke to the last caller. If you are moving that so called serpent energy that comes and originates at the base of the spine, and you're consciously moving it through the different centers of the body, we have this, the higher center, so called, 
like for instance the heart center, the throat center, the head center, those are traditionally known as the, the higher centers and those become, more, become awakened when a person has higher aspirations, aspirations to divinity, aspirations to service. Then there are again are the lower appetites and that fire could, you know, it's like a, like a, um, a firework or something like that, or a bottle rocket. You know, if yeah. you shoot that fire off and it goes astray and it goes, you know, it's errant and it flies off course, then you could theoretically injure and harm yourself. That's not to discourage so you. So it would be better to try something else then, probably? Not necessarily. It depends on your particular motive. What is your particular motive in wanting to practice Kundalini Yoga and what have you gained out of it and what are you trying to give back as a result, possibly? Well, I was just trying to find the highest spiritual practice I really could. Well, if that's the case, I would uh, encourage you possibly to maybe get on an, inter an internet search engine and look up bhakti yoga. Bhakti? Right, which uh, the spelling... Um, Hold on, let me write it down. Sure, no problem. <laughs> okay, how do you uh, spell that? B-H-A-K-T-I. B... Oops, sorry. I, I sound so loud on my TV. Uh, no, you're fine. B-H-A-K-T-I. And that bhakti yoga. And that might be something you might consider, or at least look into it and see, perhaps, maybe that's more of where you're at as far as your spiritual it's, approach and your motivation. That's more spiritual? Uh, yes, as far as uh, esoteric science generally, you know, acknowledges, yes, because there are, again, as a lower aspect of yoga, which is dealing with moving the energy through the centers, what? and then there is the aspect yeah. of yoga as a meditation. Yeah. And that includes, again, the posturing and the breathing and all that. The, in this case, the, the higher aspects, the meditational aspects, include and uh, take in these lower aspects. So it doesn't mean you have to, if you're practicing bhakti or raja yoga, you're not doing posturing. You're basically just sitting maybe in a lotus position, for instance, you know, hands crossed in the lap, the legs crossed. And you are, again, being positive, being proactive, but merging and aligning yourself with the higher aspect of yourself and then uh, reaping the benefits of that. And uh, I can speak from experience that uh, through these higher forms of meditation, the much bhakti progress. The bhakti works. I'm sorry? The bhakti works? Uh, I haven't used bhakti per se myself. I yeah. have not actually practiced any of the types of yoga outside of raja yoga and another form of yoga which is known as agni yoga, which again is a counterpart to raja yoga, yeah. which is known as um, the yoga of synthesis. And that also ties into the heart aspect in the sense that our heart, the Raja one does? Well, Raja does as well, but in particular, Agni, A-G-N-I, Agni Yoga. Agni, A-G, spell that again, I'm sorry. A-G-N-I, Agni Yoga. A-G. Okay. No, I'm sorry, A-G, Agni, A-G-N-I, Agni Yoga. Uh -huh. And that is a yoga of synthesis, and that takes into consideration <laughs> the heart in relation to the sun. The heart in our body circulates the blood in the same sense that the, the sun in our solar system circulates energy through the various planets and there's a correlation there and so this type of Agni Yoga so-called allows one in a synthetic fashion to merge one's consciousness with a larger reality as far as this larger working of energy and how that ties into service on an even more expanded scale. Well um, that sounds great. Well, again, it all depends on a person's motive, first of all, and there has to be some measure, again, of alignment. If you're too emotional in your nature or you're too mental in your nature, you're going to have uh, some problems. You, there needs to be some alignment made, some um, synth synthesis, if you will, of the lower nature so that we can be the proper channel. And again, keeping in mind we have to be a positive channel, not a passive channel, not receptive and negative, because that's where we tend to draw in the negative aspects into our into our body if we're not careful and so much caution must be exercised but again we are evolved to the point where we can handle this more so than we could a long time ago um, it's just a matter of proceeding with caution and understanding our motive why are we doing this practice why do we feel compelled to practice any sort of yoga or meditation exercise i think it's to you know lead to a higher spiritual State. If that's your particular motive, but many people just look at it as a way to get have optimum health. You know what I mean? They they think and of it as a way to. Too, I'm course. sorry. And that too, of course. Right. You can just you know some people want to just get loose and limber and and be more active physically and and have the better, again the better flow, the better optimum health of flow and energy through the system, and that uh, you know I can understand that to a certain degree, but uh, I think any improvement if it doesn't have at uh, some level some concept of serving, some level of improving oneself, 
to help uh, the lives of others, then that selfishness aspect is going to taint it at least to some small degree. Yeah. But I do thank you for your call. Have a nice evening. Okay, you too. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> uh, sorry, caller, I just lost you. I apologize. If you care to call back, I'll get you back on the air. I do apologize for that. Um, again, I would like to emphasize uh, more so uh, the idea of Agni Yoga as the idea of synthesis or also, if I could use a phrase from the Bible that really is going to tie this all in together, hopefully, in a, in a larger reality. There is a saying from the book of Matthew that's attributed to Jesus Christ. Come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you, and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest. For the yoke I will give you is easy, and the load I will put on you is light. And that ties in very much to this idea of a union with the divine. And certainly, Jesus through Christ was a very great example of this whole process of a union, of a merging, wherein the will of the individual is made one with the will of the Father. And I, again, I cannot emphasize uh, the great example we have through the gospel narratives of this very science taking place through one of the greatest disciples, Jesus through Christ. And again, the idea of taking on a yoke. Now, if we are tired from carrying heavy loads, why would it be a rest to take a yoke, to take on an added burden? Well, to try to add some light to that, this yoke of Christ, if you will, this union that can be achieved through this merging, is an alleviation. It's a lessening. By taking on this yoke, if you will, by this yoke or yoke, this merger, this union with our lower selves and the divine, we can, again, make use of this capacity that we find through this process, again, a scientific process. We can make use of this process and take the yoke, take the yoke of Christ and find within us Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory, as St. Paul spoke of. Christ consciousness, an idea of all-inclusive thought to some degree. That is very much what this concept of take my yoke involves. And again, we find Christ as the merger between the East and the West. Buddha brought out the, the quality of wisdom and anchored wisdom into our physical plane existence. And uh, Christ, in turn, anchored love. And so you have a merging of love-wisdom anchored and merged together. And that, again, is an idea of a union emerging, a synthesis, an East meets West, and an idea of, again, the yoke, the union, the union, the, uh, the yoke or the, uh, uh, yeah, again, the union, uh, the synthesis. And so that's extremely important in my estimation. I would like to go ahead and grab a call quickly. Hello, Carl. Howdy. Hi, how are you? Tomorrow. Okay. Um, yeah, about the Kundalini, I saw something on TLC, or it was either that or the Discovery Channel. Mm -hmm. And it was a short segment where they talked about Kundalini, uh, uh, it's very rare, and I wonder, is it possible that, uh, I think it was a physical barrier in one of the chakras, is what they referred to, and that caused spontaneous human combustion, even though it's very rare. Is that possible? That is very possible. That's, that's as good an explanation as any, really, because, again, the kundalini is known as the serpent fire, and we do have it latent in a center at the base of the spine, and uh, during certain circumstances, it moves up, if you will, and activates our different little centers, which are uh, sometimes, uh, if you want to get an analogy of what they may, what they may look like, wheels of fire, as, are they, as are, they're sometimes spoken of. And so if you have these other wheels of fire, uh, the idea of fire, combustion, and we are electromagnetic by nature, the physical vehicle, we are electromagnetic, and so something like that causing an, uh, a burning up of the physical vehicle uh, that's just as good as excuse as any I've ever yeah. heard. And one other question sure. is uh, last night I was watching uh, Jeff Contreras. Now Opal Divines, what day of the week and what time at Opal Divines? This particular month it's going to be on the 19th which uh, the 19th of this month and it's going to be from 8 on and again Opal Divines and myself and Jeff will be down there uh, Please head down there and check it out. You guys are all more than welcome. Um, it's very informal. It's, very, it's a very laid-back environment, and uh, we just discuss whatever. Sky's the limit. Anything that's on your mind, really. Uh, there's usually a couple of little discussion groups that break off and, and kind of elaborate on different topics and what have you. But uh, it's been a really good, positive 
experience uh, thus far, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, you know, just the idea of you know uh, having a chance to kind of further flesh out some of the concepts that uh, that I may have uh, discussed, or Jeff may discuss, or that may just maybe uh, something that uh, we haven't covered that you might consider as a good topic for us to cover as well. All uh -huh. those things are open for discussion. Yeah. Uh, also, one more question. Sure. Go ahead. How about you? Uh, is your brain cavernous and hollow? <laughs> okay, I, thank you. Bye. I don't know about all that. <laughs> hopefully not. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it's chock full of goodies. I don't know. But uh, on a serious note, the brain is merely like a stereo receiver. It's only uh, just a, a transmitting device, if you will. Mind is the actual aspect where thought and all of the concepts and ideals and principles and laws and all those things are contained that we draw from and we take through the physical brain and then we can process, just like a stereo receiver, process the information and then spit it out through the, the speakers uh, in some form of expression. And it's the same concept. Now again, uh, keeping in mind the idea of, of yoga, meaning union, uh, it, it is a way to unite our lower aspect with the higher aspect and to have a merger and to have a merger and to bring, have a bringing down, if you will, of the will aspect to the physical plane. And yoga, meditation through yoga is pretty much the, the best, safest, most effective way possible to, to pull this off. And uh, it's, again, various uh, different people are going to gravitate towards it at, at different varying levels. Some people are going to feel more compelled to, to work with the postures and the breathing exercises and that sort of thing. And that, that's what you feel compelled towards, then I would suggest to go for that and uh, experiment and exercise and find your way through these forms of yoga. And if that, at some point, spurs a larger interest in a maybe more inclusive approach, a more inclusive aspect of yoga, which again I would term uh, bhakti yoga, which is a devotional yoga, raja yoga, and then ultimately agni yoga, which agni yoga is very much still a very specialized form of yoga meditation, and uh, it has not received much widespread pa practice in, uh, in anywhere really in the world at this point in time, because again it's a bit more specialized. And uh, it's more of a, of a yoga for the future, more so, because mankind is yet even to really merge the personality and, and uh, accentuate the soul, much less be at the point where the will aspect can be anchored in and there can be a direct relation between the physical vehicle and the, uh, the will aspect of God. We usually have to have the intermediary of Christ and the hierarchy or the soul aspect or the love aspect. Those are all synonymous. And that's the stepping down or intermediary between the will and, uh, and our, ourselves here on the physical plane. And so normally we need that intermediary, but there is increasingly so, more so of a segment of the population that can stand a direct shot of the impulse of the will, and that merger can be set up in some instances. Now, I would uh, like to encourage everybody to stay tuned for Chris Athanas and the Reality Expander television show coming up next on this very channel, Channel 10. And I would like to thank my producer, Chris, for commanding the helm of the Starship Esoterica. And uh, I would like to just thank everybody here in Austin for taking the time and the opportunity to view and to call in. Uh, we are here every Tuesday live from 8 to 9 p.m. And uh, speaking about various uh, metaphysical things, if you will, and various um, various subjects that deal with the hidden or the esoteric aspect of uh, of our society. I'd like to thank you again, Austin, for viewing. Have a nice evening.